Dear Rector Magnificus, Vice President, esteemed ambassadors, esteemed guests, and a special word of welcome to the Mayor of The Hague, Joachim van Aertsen, and his spouse, Mrs. Henriette van Aertsen, the Mayor of Leiden, Henry Lemferink, former Minister Laurent Jan Brinkhorst, former Minister uh, Erika Terpstra, architect and professor Rem Koolhaas, chair of the Dutch cadaster Doreen Bourmagne and WRR councillor Peter van Lieshout. Will China save us or will it collapse? This question, or a bewildering myriad of variations on it, has repeatedly popped up in the international media. Today, I would like to demonstrate why it is absolutely nonsensical to even ask this question, as it is so intertwined with the things you thought you knew about China, but in fact, you don't. When you read the newspapers, when you see the television, China sort of evokes two kind of images. Either it is euphoria about its booming market of billion consumers, about its space program, or it is fear about its political system, about its human rights records, about China taking over Europe. However, we actually tend to see China how we see ourselves. Yet, in doing so, we often forget dimensions of space and time. We think that changes in China take place very rapidly, but actually, the opposite is true. Let me try to give you an example of how that works. If we would try to see how changes take place in China, and we make a sort of comparison between the Netherlands and between China, then the Netherlands could be likened to a barge. And China could be likened to an oil tanker. When you are out on the open sea, and you are sitting in a barge, and you see a cliff ahead, then you can still get around that cliff 50, 100 meters ahead of it. But when you're in an oil tanker, you need to start steering away from that cliff five miles ahead, which means that you need to have a long-term vision when you are looking at China. I want to talk about our perceptions of China, and more in particular about this, the distortions that we have in our perceptions of China. Why would perceptions be problematic? I think there are three possible reasons. First of all, when there are debates about China, actually if there are even debates about China in the Dutch parliament, it's always about human rights. It's very, very seldom about what China means to the Netherlands, what its economic, political, social, and cultural emergence would mean for Holland Bay Fee. Secondly, I think our perceptions that we have here in the West actually estrange those who can make a difference in China from us. What we often tend to forget is that there is an emerging middle class in China who has become increasingly politically active, writing laws, revising laws, trying to formulate new policies. And these are the people who make a difference in China. Actually, we don't see these. We don't see these people. And lastly, I think our perceptions cause that we lose a great opportunity to cooperate with a country like China and to cooperate with a potential impact. So, what are these perceptions that we have? I want to talk about these today. There are three. 
The first one is what I would call the SNAP short syndrome. The second one is what I would call euphoria disease or also yellow peril fever. And lastly, it's called the global magnifying glass. I want to take you over them one by one. Let's start with the snapshot syndrome. Well, yeah, you can see it in this cartoon uh, which appeared in, in one of the Dutch newspapers. The idea is that when you are a company and you, you want to become active in China, you have to abide by the dictates of an authoritarian regime. And if you don't do so, then, well, goodbye, then you have to leave China. That's something what happened to companies like, like Google, who are in, in trouble with their operations in China. And to be true, yes, in China, there are 66 million evicted farmers, forcefully evicted from their land, forcefully put out of their homes. Even the Chinese Minister of Land Resources, a couple of years ago, was convicted because he was implicated in land deals, in illegal land deals. And what you actually can see is that according to the United Na Nations Human Declarations on Law, or on, on human rights, no one shall be arbitrarily expropriated. But in the Chinese context, this is definitely not the case. So, human rights are problematic in China. That's a fact. As a result, a lot of people often asked me when the Arab Spring was taking place in Northern Africa and the Middle East, they asked me, Peter, do you think that there will also be a Chinese Spring in China? Do you think that there will be a revolution that will throw over the one-party rule of the Communist Party? I always tell them that this question is nonsensical because it is based on the illusion that China has gone through 30 years of economic growth, an economic explosion. But a lot of people believe that this economic explosion has taken place without any political reforms. If this was true, then China would have imploded many, many years ago. And why so? Because if you look at China today, you see a very, very complex society, a very, very complex economy. If the political system would not have been pluriform, and if these political changes wouldn't have started 30 years ago, this complex economy and society would never have been able, would never have been manageable. Let me try to give you an example of the long-term political changes that have taken place in China. To try to understand this a little bit, I think it's good to think of the French philosopher Montesquieu who said that for a democracy to function, for the rule of law to function in a country, it's necessary to have a separation of three powers, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative power. Let's have a look at the legislative power, or the National People's Congress in China. It has always been known as a rubber stamp, meaning that when there is a bill or a new law coming for vote, in the National People's Congress, the 1,600 delegates or some, uh, something like that, they see the bill, they go like, okay, uh, it's fine, we approve it, they put a stamp on it. That's the popular image that people think of the National People's Congress in China. I want to give you a very specific example in where you see very particular changes. In 1994, China started the formulation of the new property law. And the property law is, of course, a crucial piece of legislation because it regulates the transfer of property. 
And that is an enormous fundamental principle in any kind of economy, that property can be protected by law. I told you it started in 1994, but it was actually only adopted in 2007, 13 years later. Over these 13 years, the Chinese property law was revised seven times, and there were two different versions of the law. Why so? Because the law, it started with a draft, drafted by the Academy of, the Social, Academy of Social Sciences in China. After a while, there was a group of jurists at the People's University who said, actually, we don't think this is such a very good draft. We want to draft a new one. And so they did. At a certain moment, there were two different drafts in circulation and under discussion at the National People's Congress. It was scheduled for adoption in 2006. However, this didn't happen. And why so? Because in 2006, there was a professor of the Peking University named Gong, and he said, if this property law is going to be adopted, then it will legitimize the theft of state assets by a rich, wealthy few. And actually what he meant is the picture that you just saw, the large-scale expropriation of people from their homes and their land. He wrote a letter about this to the president of China, but he never got a reply. So the professor said, you know what I do? I put my letter on the internet. This raised such an enormous discussion in China that one month later, he was sitting in the National People's Congress to explain to the delegates what he meant by this letter. At that time, the National People's Congress said, if it is true what this professor says, then we can't adopt the law right now. We have to postpone it and first examine, establish a commission to research what is true and what is not true about this letter. And so they did. It took a full year. And then the law was adopted in 2007. Why am I telling you all this? Because in this story, you can see that the National People's Congress is exercising three fundamental rights that any parliament in the world has, namely the right of initiative, the right of amendment, the, and the right of examination. Meaning, the National People's Congress can start the formulation of a law, it can revise it, and it can also ask for study to study certain critical societal issues. In the, in the way how the National People's Congress exercises these rights, it's actually not much different than our Tweede Kamer or our Dutch Parliament. This is the first perception that we have of China. Let me move on to the second one, or the euphoria disease and yellow peril fever. Uh, there are actually, as with many viral diseases, there are different types, and I will first talk about type 1. The Euro crisis. There has been a lot of debate that China will save Europe because Europe is now going through such dark times. And why would China do so? Well, it's filthy rich. It has 3.2 trillion US dollars in foreign exchange reserves, the largest reserve of, uh, of the world. What could China do? It could invest in the European Emergency Fund, or it could invest in a fund that's managed by the IMF. People say, if China wants to do that, it wants something in return. What would it want? It might want more political leverage. It might want less critique on its monetary policy. Read critique on not appreciating the renminbi, the national currency. Actually, I think that 
these are not the main things that China would want. If you look at the future geopolitical constellation, China is bound to get more voting power in multilateral organizations. It's not something that they would bother so much about at this time. I think if we want to understand where there are parallels or where there is a possible synergy between the EU and China, we have to see China as an investor. And why so? Because China is sitting on these 3.2 trillion US dollar. And its main problem is that it's US dollars. So China has to diversify it. It tried to do so by trying to look at Europe and trying to invest in Europe. But then suddenly Europe collapsed with the Euro crisis. And China was looking to other places in the world to see how it could try to invest in a responsible way. And if you try to see China in this way, you also see what an investor wants. An investor <coughs> wants profit over the long run. And where there is that possibility, there is also the possibility for China to look at underpriced sectors and industries in Europe. Because of the Euro crisis, certain sectors, certain industries have become underpriced. Meaning that the confidence of consumers has taken a deep dip. And as a result of that, these sectors are far below the market price. Meaning that over 10, maybe 15 years, you can get some nice profit from investing in these sectors. That is a possibility for cooperation and also for mutual economic exchange between China and the EU. However, having said this, what might be economically viable or what might be economically a very sensible thing to do to invest in certain underpriced sectors is not what is politically acceptable or politically feasible. And there are many such examples. For example, try, China tried to invest in the Greek harbor of Piraeus. A couple of years ago, it tried to uh, buy the American com company Unoco. Or it even tried to buy the Amsterdam cable company Draca. But all these deals didn't materialize. And there were political reasons why they didn't materialize. So you see that what is economically viable is not always what politically can happen. And that determines also the space of maneuver for a country like China. Let me tell you a little bit more about the second perception that we have. The second type. Euphoria disease and yellow per peril fever. Will China collapse? A lot of people have asked this question and they keep on asking it because China has a bubble under its real estate sector. And this is not the first time in world economic history that a bubble under the real estate sector led to a worldwide economic recession. We have seen this during the 1997 Asian crisis, which started in Thailand and in its real estate sector. We saw it in the 2007 US credit crunch, and maybe we might see it in 2012 in China. Let's have a look at the Chinese real estate sector. Former President Deng Xiaoping, he said, getting rich is glorious. And that's something what you definitely see in the real estate sector in China. It is one of the most profitable sectors in China. It belongs to the top 10. Its average profits, and this is actually a conservative as estimate, are about three times the world average. To give you an example, Liuchen village in Beijing was expropriated from farmers for 177 renminbi per square meter, and it was sold later on for 6,750 renminbi. So you can see what kind of profit you can make by investing in real estate in China. 
So it's no surprise that of 50 Chinese billionaires, 29 of them stated that real estate was their main source of income. Actually, there's a lot of debate. Is there a bubble under Chinese real estate or is there really no bubble? Well, let's go over it. This is one camp, the, 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 the camp that says, yes, there is a bubble. And they say, well, over the past years, prices have really exploded, uh, rising by four to 500%. In 2010, the Chinese government already started to try to control with very strict measures to try to control the real estate market. But even then, despite the strict controls, the real estate prices in Beijing were still, in one year, changing with 42%. What you also see is that the ratio between income, your average income, and the average price of a home in China is completely but really completely out of proportion. In China, it's 27 to 1. In the Netherlands, it's about 8 to 1. So you have an idea. And there are a lot of empty homes in China, around 64 million. So people say, yes, there is a, there is a bubble in China. Actually, there are also those who say, no, there's no bubble, because there are very few mortgages in China, around 40% in 2010, 40% of the GDP. If you compare that to the United States, that was the double at the start of the economic crisis. China also has a high private home ownership. Its real estate is mostly for investment and not for use, and house prices can actually still increase because a lot of a large proportion of Chinese people are still living in quite bad homes, so they would still like to move to better homes. So there is still room for an increase of prices coupled with an increase of livelihood in China. What would I conclude? I would say yes, there is a bubble in China. There is a bubble under the real estate sector. However, we have to see also China's institutional makeup. And what we see here is a strong developmental state. As a result, China's domestic market is relatively insulated from the world economy. And you see that, for example, in the renminbi, which is not freely convertible. You can also see that a scenario of a capital flight is very unlikely in China. I don't know if any of you have tried to save 5,000, more than 5,000 US dollar on a Chinese bank. I can tell you it's not easy to do that. It's even more difficult to take it out of the bank. <laughs> so you can see that the Chinese state has a strong grip over the economy. Also, the Chinese government ordered the banks to raise their reserves. They basically just ordered it. They said, you have to raise your reserves. And in just one year, it was raised seven times to 21%. In the EU, we were discussing whether during the Euro crisis, we should maybe raise it to six or 7%. So again, you see a difference with China. And the Chinese government in the end said, we have to restrict home ownership. So, in Beijing, you can have no more than two homes. What might happen with the bubble? I think it will probably gradually deflate. We actually see that happening already starting from this year, where prices in Beijing and Shanghai are under high pressure and prices are actually gradually de decreasing. What we also probably will see is China, no, it will not save Europe. It doesn't work that way, but in a way it might be an indirect savior because it might invest in underpriced sectors and industries that are not possible to manage for Europe, but it might be interesting for China. Okay, the last perception that I want to talk about, the global magnifying glass. 
Actually, the whole world sort of puts a magnifying glass on China. And as a result, we magnify every minute move that China is making just because it is China. And one of these perceptions is tied to the question, is China colonizing Africa? Well, a component of that is that China is grabbing land in Africa. And you see that in the quote behind me, uh, the NGO Grain said, from Kazakhstan to Queensland and from Mozambique to the Philippines, a steady and familiar process is underway with Chinese leasing or buying up land. Actually, if we look into the statistics, into the available statistics of land grabbing by China, what we see is that they are inconsistent, they are fra fragmentary, or they are downright absent. What we don't have is research on the ground, fieldwork research. As a result, all the sources, because we made an inventory of all the available sources on Chinese land grabbing. There were more than 90, and just three of them were scientific sources. What do actually the numbers tell us? If we put all these statistics together, what we see is that actually China is not grabbing land, or China is not investing in land for agriculture in Africa, no, it's investing most of it in Southeast Asia. What do the numbers also tell us? That most investments actually never materialize. And lastly, what we see as a result of the fact that most of these investments do not materialize, China is actually moving to other countries and more particular industrialized countries, like trying to buy up wine arts, vi uh, vineyards in France, or in dairy farms in Australia, or investing in Canada, rather than in unstable markets like in Africa. What we actually see is that the media, they often portray that China is grabbing land, but most of these investments are not realized. I would like to give you an example of the problems that exist with statistical numbers if we are looking at China's allegedly land grabbing. Oxfam Novib published a report in 2011 and said worldwide, over the whole world, as much as 227 million hectares land has been sold or leased since 2001. Of these 227 million, 70% has approximately, uh, or approximately 160 million has taken place in Africa. In our research, we found that China has acquired 3.2 million hectares in Africa. That's the maximum statistics, that's the maximum number. Why do I say why, that it is the maximum number? Because there are only two sources that give an exact figure. One is 3.2 million, and the other is 10,000 hectares. The problem with the 3.2 million is that it is caused by one single investment by one company, namely ZTE Telecom Company. But just for the sake of argument, let's say that we start from the maximum number, 3.2 million hectares. So 160 million hectares grabbed in Africa, minus 3.2 million, then we are still left with 56.8 million hectares grabbed by whom? This is a question. Either this means that we have to rethink China as the largest land grabber in Africa, or what I would say, we definitely have to look more critically at the statistics. I want to say just a few words about the future research agenda that I would like to put, push forward at the Modern East Asia Research Center and in my position as Chair Professor of Chinese Economy and Development. I want 
to work on an ERC, European Research Council funded project on economic stability and collapse in China. Well, and you've seen the question, will China collapse, yes or no? That is one of the questions that I want to tr try to address in that research project. A second project is actually a consortium which I have uh, been able to establish with the support of many, many colleagues here at the University of Leiden, uh, of the Center for, for Environmental Studies, of the Van Vollenhoven Institute, of the Institute for History. Uh, all these kinds of institutions have helped in setting up a research consortium called China GX, or China's Global Expansion. And land grabs will probably be one part of that. Sorry. Um, a third project is a Ford, fund, a Ford Foundation funded project on pastoralism in China's northwest, which is the poorer region or the poorest region in China. We oftentimes tend to forget that. We see China as a glamorous, high rising uh, economy with these uh, eight lanes, highways, and uh, fast speed maglev trains. But China also has a third world, which is in the northwest. And lastly, in the afternoon, with my colleagues, I want to present the research strategy of the Modern East Asia Research Center. I have come to a final word of thanks. And I could not have stand, stood here in this room without the support of many, many, many people. And I hope you will bear with me because I want to try to acknowledge their support for me personally. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Wim van den Doel, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, and particularly Professor Machiel van Krevel, Scientific Director of the LIAS, for enabling and supporting my appointment as Chair Professor of Chinese Economy and Development. When I was still Chair Professor of International Development Studies in Groningen, he gradually convinced me to leave the northern city of Grun, as they say, and come to Leiden. Furthermore, I would also like to thank the Merck Foundation Board for their support and faith in me as the new director of Merck, or the Modern East Asia Research Center. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Dow Bremer, former Rector Magnificus of Leiden University, for his ever thoughtful advice suggestions and patient guidance, as well as André Baron van Heemstra, Chair of the Merck Board, and Ralf Kroener, of Council at Eversheds Fasen. A special word of gratitude I would like to express to Merck patron, Professor Laurens Jan Brinkhorst, former Minister of Economic Affairs. Dear Laurens Jan, Ever since we met during a television interview about Haagse Stuivers and Rijnlandse Daalders, or whatever, you will have lent your great support to me and to Merck. Thanks so much for this. I look greatly forward to collaborate with all of you, as well as with the Merck staff and affiliates. Together with my fellow director and dean of the Leiden University College in The Hague, Professor Goto Jones, who unfortunately could not be here because of illness, as well as with the staff of the China, Japan and Korea departments, headed by Professor Frank Pieke, Kasia Svertka and Remco Breuker, I am very confident that we can turn Merck into a strong, vibrant institution that can serve as an influential platform on East Asia between academia government, and the corporate sector. Another one of the Merck patrons needs special mentioning because of his great support to the Academic China Meeting, or ACO. Without Dr. Philip de Heer, former Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and current Ambassador to Japan, ACO would not have existed. Almost 10 years ago, ACO was established out of his idea since then, ACO has worked closely with and has been continuously and generously supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. One of the questions posed to me before coming to Leiden was whether the Secretariat of ACO or the Dutch Academic China Meeting 
would also move from Groningen to Leiden. And there seemed to be a certain relief when the answer to that question was affirmative. That ACO has become something to negotiate about is the result of the hard work by many, many people. ACO's successes would not have been possible without the ministry's support, nor without the help of the ACO board members, Professor Meine Pieter van Dijk, Professor Koos Krabbedam, and Charlotte van Hees of the VSNU. I also look forward to cooperating with the new board members, Dr. Jeroen de Kloet, as well as Professor Heiko Ebbers. Several other persons have also been my great support and counsel, not in the least by freeing up overloaded agendas and simply be here to turn this day into success. Here I would like to mention Henry Lemferink, Mayor of Leiden, Peter van Lieshout, and Doreen Burmanje. Dear Henry, thanks so much for your help in bringing the idea for an Asian knowledge and business park to further fruition. With your support as mayor of Leiden, I feel confident that the Asian Knowledge and Business Park can be made into a great success. Dear Peter, I still bear great memories of your WRR mission to China, which you entrusted to me. I want to thank you for your faith in me, as well as for all the help helpful suggestions you provided on various issues, including the opportunities and pitfalls for the Asian Knowledge and Business Park. Dear Doreen, I hope we can work even more closely after you gave Sino-Dutch bilateral cooperation on titling and spatial planning a boost during our joint trip to China with then Minister Jacqueline Kramer. In different ways, two other persons have also persistently supported and led my way, and I would like to mention them in particular and express my personal gratitude. Josias van Aertsen and Rem Koolhaas. Dear Josias, many years ago, when I was still doing my PhD on desertification and nomads in China, you believed in me and allowed me to serve as your personal interpreter during the many, many high-level meetings you had as Minister of Agriculture and later as Minister of Foreign Affairs. During these years, it has struck me how in the most difficult and hectic circumstances you always remain friendly and unbelievably calm, warmly reaching out to all those around you, making them feel at ease at, ease at the same time. You were there to, to congratulate me when I became professor in Groningen, and now you are here in person to turn the day of my oratie into an unforgettable event. Thank you for your trust, guidance, and mental support. Actually, I still have a personal confession to make to you. During my first trip as your at that time, still very inexperienced and rather nervous interpreter, your cabinet chief whispered to me, remember, you are the minister's shadow. Where he goes, you go. And so I did, as ordered. I followed you like a shadow, wherever you went. One day, after a full day of busy meetings with Chinese ministers and Politburo members, you suddenly walked off. You seemed in a hurry. I closely followed you through a maze of corridors, right behind your back, only to suddenly find out that I had followed you straight into the toilet. <laughs> Dear Rem, once on a lazy Saturday afternoon, I leafed through the NSC Handelsblatt to read that you had commended my book, China's Embedded Activism. I was absolutely taken by surprise and felt overly honored that a famous icon like you would commend my work, a book that I thought was just something I had written for a small scholarly in-crowd. 
Later, you told me that you had heard about it through an interview with Ra Jan Marijnissen, which, as you said, caught your attention because you heard a different voice on China. That you are here to give a keynote in the afternoon is a great honor and for me, and for me personally a huge support. I'd like to thank you for all what you've done for me over the past years. Lastly, many people from the Chinese community have supported me. And in this regard, in this regard I'd like to thank those from Lian Yihui, the IOC, Initiative, and please forgive me if I forget many other Chinese organizations and associations. I have unfortunately no time to thank everybody for all their help to me, otherwise we'd still be here tomorrow. So please forgive me if I haven't mentioned you, but know that I do remember in my heart what you have done. Dear guests, this was China on the, right on the left hand side almost 20 years ago. The traffic and a kitchen. On the other hand, you see China as it is today. The picture of the street with all the bicycles, that same picture around the same spot was taken so many years later. And this is how a kitchen looks like for many Chinese today. So you see an enormous change over 20, 30 years of time. During all these years, I have been accompanied by a bright star that has lit my way ever since. And I'd like to say a few words about that. The Chinese know the concept of a common destiny, termed yuanfen. It is an indefinite, frightening, and happy feeling. It is indefinite because it evades man each time he attempts to grasp it. It is frightening because it exceeds his power and stretches beyond anything he can fathom, his own beginning and his ending. Yet, yun fun is also a feeling of intense happiness as it ties man to a whole that intertwines his individual self with the other. I share my yunfen with her and with her whom she gave me. It is to them that I dedicate this inaugural address. Now, may I please invite all of you for lunch and drinks in the room next door. I hope we will also see each other in the afternoon during the Merck strategy launch and the keynote lecture by Professor Rem Kohlhaas. Ik heb Gezegd.